I feel that most of you know me by now, uh, but my name is John Dale. Um, if you have kids that attend Fulton Elementary School, they will know me as Papa John. So I have been married 33 plus years, that's quite a while, to my wife Stacy, and we have two boys, Matt and Ryan. Ryan still lives at home, he's on the left, and works at the Fulton High School as a tech advisor. I'll admit it is kind of odd to hear my son called Mr. Dale and myself Papa John. Being called Papa John works at the school, but requires a bit of explanation when a child in his store says, Hi, Papa John, and the parents give me an odd look. So Matt is in the middle there. He is a certified PGA golf pro in Muscatine, Iowa at the Geneva Country Club. He's married to his wife, Nicole, which is on the right. And we have a little granddaughter named Evie, who's on the lower right corner there. So if you look at this picture, this is probably one of my favorite pictures right now. And yes, this is a shameless ploy to show off our cute little granddaughter, Evie. And Matt, if you're listening online, Grandpa says that Evie can have as many chocolate chip cookies as she wants. So, <laughs> so I believe that life is full of seasons. As I become more seasoned, I have felt my calling to switching gears a bit through the years. I still love working with the youth group, and I see Pauline Parrish is here. Where'd she go? I thought she was here. here. Okay, where are you? Right oh, there you are. So I will say that I think I started with you in youth group. Perfect. So that's awesome that you're here. So um, I still love uh, working with the youth group um, and actually promoting concerts too. But I also feel a calling to lead the big church setting in the big church setting, i.e. hosting with Colleen and Pastor Scott and now preaching too. I want you to know this morning that there are many men in this church who have been a big influence in my life. One in particular, Tom Van Zuden, has really challenged me to do some more in-depth reading and studying, so I decided to take him up on his challenge and read some Charles Spurgeon this year. About a month ago, I read a statement from Charles Spurgeon that intrigued me. It said, Satan tells me that I am unworthy, but I always have been. Let that sink in. Again, Satan tells me I am unworthy, but I always have been. We have been in a series for a few weeks now on rescue. Today I would like to touch on two ways that God rescued us from being unworthy. So here is the definition of unworthy. Not deserving of effort, attention, or respect, and having little value or merit. Satan tells me I am unworthy that I am not deserving of effort and have little value. And I believe Satan to be half correct. We are unworthy, but Satan wants to put an exclamation point behind the word unworthy. God wants to put a comma and the word but behind the word unworthy. Today I want to look at two ways that we feel unworthy and how God has rescued us. Let's pray over the message this morning. Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you for the opportunity to come up here and speak this morning uh, to everyone, Lord. Uh, help me to be the vessel that you would want me to be. Help the words to come out of my mouth that you would want to come out. And Lord, help us to hear them today and not just to go out the door and not apply them to our lives, but to apply them throughout the week. Lord, we thank you so much that we are able to come on Sunday mornings to uh, drop what's going on in our busy weeks and to just uh, be with each other and to worship together. Lord, we thank you for this time. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So the first point I've got is uh, I feel unworthy to speak to other people and spread the gospel to others. And let's take a look at Moses this morning. Exodus 4, 10 through 16 says, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, pardon your servant. I will help. Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. 
Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God talking to him. So let's take a moment and look at the backstory in chapter 4 of Exodus. God is speaking with Moses about going back to Egypt. Moses is reluctant on what the crowd reaction will be. And I think it's human nature to overthink a conversation in your mind and to look at the negative outcomes versus the positive ones. This leads to panic and anxiety before the conversation has even started. Moses is seemingly wanting to see or fear the worst case scenario when he returns to Egypt. God even provides Moses signs to show the people that his conversation with him is real. A staff turned into a snake and back to a staff. Leprosy on both hands and then not. Water from the Nile that turns to blood. Those are powerful visual signs. How about us? Ever had a powerful sign uh, show before you that prompted you to move? For me, not to the extreme that Moses maybe, but witnessed, uh, but I get signs all the time on discerning music coming to our area. With all the signs, Moses is still reluctant to go. Acts 7.22 says that Moses was said to be educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. So why was it that Moses felt unworthy to speak? I have read articles that said Moses had a stutter or that he didn't understand the language being spoken. These were most likely the reservations that Moses had speaking with God. Even if either of these were true, or maybe even both, look how important Moses was throughout Old Testament scriptures. Modern day, when I think of stuttering, I think of Jason Gray, the contemporary Christian recording artist, who stutters when he carries a conversation, but has a wonderful singing voice. In a recent interview on YouTube, Jason stated he felt God uses our weakness for his glory. The weakness of the stutter leads to beautiful music being sung for the Lord. Closer to home, I think of a conversation I had with a worker about a month ago, a co-worker. We had a great chat about our faith, and the co-worker wished she had the knowledge to speak when asked a question about her faith. My response was, read the scriptures and pray about opportunities that may arise. If she is here today, and I don't see her today, but uh, if she is here, I'm going to connect with her afterwards, after the service, to get her started on her journey of faith with a devotional. I don't see her, though, so check that out. I found it interesting that right in the middle of the passage, God told Moses, now go. I've heard your reservations, but you need to trust that I will be there with you. Have you ever had an opportunity to speak to someone about your faith, and for whatever reason you didn't, was it because you didn't feel equipped? Was it because you didn't handle certain personalities well? Was it because you were afraid of rejection or ridicule? I can answer yes to all three of those. No matter the reason, God is telling us to go, and he, he will be with us. If you read in Matthew 10, 19, and 20, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. Mark 13, 11 says, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Two different passages where Jesus was speaking to his disciples about not worrying what to say. The Holy Spirit would give them the words to say. Moses felt unworthy to speak, but with God's help and guidance, Moses became one of the most prominent men in the Old Testament scriptures. Point number two. I feel unworthy of forgiveness because my past sins are too much to forgive. Let's take a look at the woman accused of adultery and brought to Jesus by the teachers of the law and Pharisees. 
John 8, 7 through 11 says, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now the first thing that stands out to me in this passage is what is Jesus writing in the sand? It is speculated that he was either writing the names of the accusers or writing the sins of the accusers. The second thing that stands out to me is the older accusers were the first to leave. In my Bible notes, it is most likely that the older generation was more mature and aware of their sin. The stigma of self-righteousness probably clouded the younger generation, but in time, they left also. Either way, old or young, we should be honestly taking a constant look at our lives, recognizing that we need Jesus for the sin that has occurred in our life. I think we see an opportunity for repentance. Turn from going in the wrong direction and stand and start going in the right direction. Romans 7:15 says, "I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do." The love of Jesus brings the thought of hate, the sin, love the sinner. Grace and mercy in exchange for a new start. Jesus seems genuinely wanting to care for the woman regardless of her past. But Jesus didn't condemn the woman. But I find it interesting that he also didn't ignore or condone the sin of the woman. Jesus showed compassion and forgiveness. Satan wants to keep us stuck in the past. Keep the shame over our heads. Tell us there's no way God can forgive that. God tells us that the past is forgiven. That there are new mercies and graces offered each day that there is no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. Chances are, most if not all of us have something in the past that we are not proud of. Sin that was in our lives. It may still be an issue today. For me, I know when I met my wife Stacy, I was not headed in the right direction. I was doing things that I was not proud of. One of the first times I met my future wife's parents, I was wearing this. There it is. <laughs> yeah, there's a proud moment. A t-shirt of a skull cowboy holding a gun. A t-shirt that I was wearing. What was I thinking? I could picture her parents thinking, what has our daughter brought home? I know this is kind of a lighthearted analogy, uh, but I want you to understand the context of it. This was a time when I was partying and seeking the world versus seeking God. I still struggle with a couple of these things today. This woman felt unworthy of forgiveness because of her past, but Jesus offered her compassion, grace, and mercy and encouraged her to sin no more. Satan wants me to feel unworthy to speak and spread the gospel to others and put an exclamation point behind it. God wants me to know that I am unworthy, but with God's help and guidance, we are worthy to go out and spread the gospel. Matthew 28, 19 is my favorite verse. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are called to do this. Satan wants me to feel unworthy of forgiveness and put an exclamation point behind it. God wants me to know that I am unworthy, but, what, but with compassion, grace, mercy, and a repentant heart, I am worthy of forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And we are called to do this too. So, what if this is just a great story and nothing else? What if we decide that we will do things our way and not lean into all that God has for us? 
dare I say that Satan is 100% correct and that we are not worthy with an exclamation point. If we buy into Satan's lie and put an exclamation point behind the unworthy statement, will we ever feel forgiven and freed by the blood of Christ? Will we ever feel confident in our ability to share the gospel and good news of Jesus with others? Will we truly believe that there is no condemnation? Will we ever feel the Holy Spirit leading us? We are forgiven and not condemned to our past. We have the Holy Spirit, the third leg of the Trinity, to lead our conversations. God has rescued us through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Savior that we needed to pay the price, and we are worthy only because of this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you so much uh, for the words this morning. Um, I know the message was a little quicker than normal, Lord, but it's just what I was feeling led to do. Lord, help us to know that we uh, are worthy only because of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you sent to this earth to do many things, uh, but ultimately to pay the punishment of sin for each and every one of us. Lord, help us to see that we are worthy in your eyes because of this. We are worthy to go out and spread the gospel to others, and we are worthy of the forgiveness of sin because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Help us again to just hear these words and apply them to our lives uh, throughout the rest of this week. It's in your name we pray.